landlords in this room, and indeed most of us who deal with residential lettings, have become familiar with the concept of tenancy deposit protection. Introduced in April 2007, in accordance with the Housing Act 2004, we we'll probably all know that a tenancy deposit taken on an assured short-hold tenancy must be protected in one of the government-approved schemes and that tenancy deposit held as stakeholder. If a tenancy deposit was not protected, as it should, then penalties would be imposed. A Section 21 notice could not be served and the deposit must be returned in full to the tenant. There was also a penalty of three times the amount of the deposit payable by the landlord to the tenant. So far, so good. All things quite clear cut and easy. The monies, as we all know, are protected so that the tenant will never face the prospect of a landlord taking the money without um, really. Uh, being able to claim it, or if the tenant wanted to dispute what the landlord was claiming, the Tenancy Deposit Protection Scheme offered a free adjudication service. Well, we all thought that seemed very sensible and very reasonable, with no problems. However, the legislators, it's the legislators who put together our legislation, but it's the judiciary that then have to interpret that legislation. Now I'm sure when the very learned people got together to draft the Housing Act 2004, they knew exactly what they meant and how they expected it to work. But the legislation relating to tenancy deposit protection seemed very open to interpretation when it was put in front of a judge. And further clarification was clearly needed as confusion rate. So the Localism Act 2011, which mainly dealt with local authority issues, also included in it a section relating to tenancy <coughs> deposit protection. The intention being to clarify the situation for one, once and all. The Localism Act says, You've got 30 days to protect that tenancy deposit. If you go past that date, if you get to day 31, then you're in trouble. A section 21 notice cannot be served. And now if you use court papers to get possession, as I'm sure probably will be told later on, they, the question's actually asked, where is the tenancy deposit protected? The only way to serve a Section 21 notice, if you have not protected the deposit, is to give that deposit back in full to the tenant. You will have that deposit. And it's now up to the discretion of the judge whether they award one or three times the amount of the deposit as a penalty. The Localism Act now would surely answer all of those queries relating to tenancy deposit protection. With leaders, we are very stringent with respect to tenancy deposit protection. I personally sit on the TDS forum, and any landlord or tenant using a leader's branch can be rest assured that a deposit will be protected correctly within 30 days. So all should now be quiet in the world of tenancy deposit protection. That's your thought. But then the Court of Appeal laid down a ruling in a now notorious case, Super Strike Limited versus Rodriguez. So what's this all about? So let's go back to April 2007 and the introduction of tenancy deposit protection. At that time, the guidance from the DCLG and the then three government-approved scheme providers confirmed that any AST tenancy entered into writing after that date, the deposit must be protected. The instruction was clear. A tenancy that began prior to April 2007 
and became periodic immediately after that state, did not need protection. However, the recent Court of Appeal ruling has now confirmed that a periodic tenancy should be treated as a new tenancy because it arose at the end of the previous fixed term. The Court of Appeal... Can't hear me. No. Sorry. Um, <coughs> you want to twiddle? <laughs> the Court of, Arreal, of, of Appeal ruling... Sorry, I've lost my place. I'm sorry if I'm saying this again. Hear it again. The Court of Appeal ruling is now confirmed that a periodic tenancy should be treated as a new tenancy because it arose at the end of the previous fixed term tenancy. So what that means is that any periodic tenancy that any tenancy that started before April 2007, <coughs> so the deposit was not protected and then immediately, immediately became a periodic after April 2007, that tenancy deposit must be protected now. The prescribed information must be served and the relevant scheme leaflet forwarded to your tenant. Now be careful with that prescribed information. Anything is prescribed means that you've got to complete it correctly. Don't take half measures because that would deem that tenancy deposit has not been properly <coughs> protected. The importance of, prote of correctly protecting the deposit, reserving the prescribed information and reissuing the uh, scheme leaflet cannot be emphasised enough. You get it wrong, and there is a possibility that the deposit will not be deemed protected with all the problems that that will then present to that landlord. So whilst talking about tenancy deposits, just a reminder that of course the most important thing in order to assure that any landlord can rightfully claim against the tenancy deposit is a good inventory. Without an inventory, there is no evidence to support a claim. Any inventory or all inventories must be comprehensive and detailed. An inventory such as this will simply not assist any landlord in making a claim against the tenancy. Whereas leaders provide themselves, pride themselves on their inventories. They are professionally prepared and as you can see the content of them is very thorough. That's the sort of document you need in order to ensure your claim against the tenant's deposit will be looked at positively by any adjudication. <coughs> so in summary, you will need, in order to ensure any rightful claim against the tenancy deposit, providing that tenancy deposit is accurately correct, uh, protected, you need a good professional inventory because that is proof of the condition of the property at both the beginning of the tenancy and at the end. In the case of a dispute, the deposit scheme adjudicator will need to see such evidence in order to come to a satisfactory conclusion. All the scheme providers <coughs> view the tenancy deposit is the tenant's money, but it is. And it's up to the landlord to be able to evidence any claim as to why they are entitled to any of that tenancy deposit. That's why you need a good inventory. Okay, so just a little bit more, we're looking very serious, um, about uh, what's going on in residential lettings. A little bit about client money protection, um, probably up in mind in, in some of uh, the minds of <coughs> landlords who are living right now. 
Currently, there is absolutely no requirement for a letting agent to be regulated. Leaders as a professional agent self-regulate. We are members of ARLA, the Property Ombudsman, and Safe Agent. Safe Agent, what a fantastic logo. It actually tells everybody what it's all about. With the number of unregulated agents which can open and close overnight, taking considerable sums of money with them, any landlord or tenant seeing that safe agent logo will know that the letting agent they have elected to deal with has client money protection in place and their money is safe. <coughs> Safe Agent, as with ARLA, regularly audit its members to ensure compliance with their membership requirements. So one message you should take with you today is that whatever agent you choose to use, you must always ensure that agent is a safe agent, has client money protection in place, and your money is protected. Right, houses in multiple occupancy. As well as tenancy deposit protection, the Housing Act 2004 introduced the mandatory licensing of HMOs, houses in multiple occupancy, when they fall into certain criteria. Local authorities also have the ability, by <coughs> following certain procedures, to introduce selective licensing. Brighton and Hove City Council have done this and extended their licensing scheme to the wards of Hanover and Elm Grove. I'm going to say this wrong. Morscombe. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't come from Tussex. Morscombe and Bevendean, St Peter's and North Lane, Hollandine and Stanmore, <laughs> Queen's Park. Properties in this area, if they are, two or, if they are of two or more stories, and have three or more occupiers require a license. The penalties are quite high. The fines are up to £20,000 if a property is not licensed. Plus, there are fines of £5,000 for each breach of the license. Recently, Southampton successfully fined a landlord £40,000 for four offences relating to poor housing conditions and management of housing multiple occupants. If you are a cash strapped local authority, that's quite a good way of putting some money in the bank. If your property requires a license, then please make sure you have one in place. It could cost you a lot if you don't. And just a last little bit here. Government are looking at proposals for really illegal immigrants in rented accommodation. On the 3rd of July this year, immigration officials raided a series of beds in sheds. They found 10, 12 people crammed into a small terraced house, and nearby <coughs> a couple were found to be sleeping in an outhouse. People who perhaps do not have the legal right to live in to work in our country are very vulnerable. And there are people out there who are willing to charge them a lot of money and, uh, and to put them in dreadful housing conditions. Under government plans, we <coughs> to rent houses to foreign citizens with no right to live and work in the UK face fines of up to so this is where you need to ensure stringent credit and referencing checking. It's got, it will be vital in ensuring that your tenants have a le legitimate right to live and work in the UK. <coughs> it's an unfortunate fact of life that many people who have no right to live here will, in desperation, perhaps provide forged documents. Just for your information, the attached slide 
provides a few examples of what to look for when endeavouring to ascertain whether a passport has been produced fraudulently. <coughs> but you as a landlord will have to show the due diligence if you let your property to a tenant who does not have the right to live and work here, you would have to prove you've endeavoured to <coughs> ensure that they had or did have the right. So these are just a few examples of how perhaps you could spot a forged passport, because obviously anybody with a British passport has the right to live and work in the UK. <coughs> Also, perhaps think about driving licences. I think we're so used nowadays to that plastic card, we assume that's a driving licence. Well, actually, a driving licence is made up of two components, the plastic card and the paper. A lot of people think about forging the plastic card and don't get round <coughs> to producing the paper forgery. You should really ask, we should all ask, for both, if we're using a driving license as a means of trying to prove that somebody has uh, who they are. So, just to conclude, the private re rented sector, as, as David's just said, now provides a viable long term housing op option for many of us in the UK. And because of that, it's now very much under the spotlight with many changes in legislation aimed at protecting the tenant and the local community. If you're a landlord and you get it wrong, it can be costly. Seek the right advice, use a regulated safe agent, <coughs> and minimise any opportunity for error.